Hey, it's Tony Robbins. Welcome back. Listen, you're back to Money Master the Game, seven simple steps to financial freedom. In our third session here, I'd like to now talk to you about step number two. Remember, step number one was tap the power. Make the most important financial decision of your life, which is to stop trading time for money, to become an owner, not just to somebody who is you know, buying things, but somebody who has become an investor. And the way you have to do that is by deciding a percentage you're going to save, and you're going to keep that and put it into a financial freedom fund. You're going to take that money before you see it, put it aside, and you're going to invest it. I know the question you want to ask yourself is, okay, Tony, where do I put it? Before I tell you some places of what the best on earth say where to put it and how to divide that up, we first got to go to the second step. And that second step is become an insider. So you have to know the rules before you get in the game. I mean, think about it. We've all heard the story, it's been said a million times, it's almost trite, that when a person with experience meets a person with money, the person with experience ends up with the money and the person with money ends up with the experience. And that happens every single day in the financial world. The financial world is des designed primarily not to meet the needs of an individual investor, but to meet the needs of the organizations that have built them. That's why we have this high frequency trading where somebody knows what you're gonna buy in advance, in milliseconds, buys and sells and makes money off of you, because the system is not about protecting you as by now I'm sure you're, you're, we're well aware of. However, even though some people will call that system rigged, there's a way you can still win, but you gotta know the rules or you're gonna get hurt. This is an area where most people start to do okay financially and then something happened and they got burned and then they give up and you just can't give up. So I'm here to make sure you don't get burned. If you're burned in the past, put that behind you. It's not gonna happen again. And in my book here, I'm covering nine of the biggest financial lies. They're basically marketed myths that people buy into that allows other people to take control of your finances and make much more from your money than they ever should in a million years. So let's start out. Let me just start out by saying, let's you and I become the insider by starting to understand how this system works. And let's do it by just asking a simple question. What if I said to you right now, what if I said, I want you to imagine just for a moment, someone comes to you with the following investment opportunity. The person says they want you to put up 100% of the capital, they want you to take 100% of the risk, and if it makes money, they want 60% or more of your upside over the life of your investments over decades. They want that to come to them, even though they put up no money and they took no risks. Are you, you going to make a deal where you put up all the money, take all the risk, they take no risk, put up no money, they get 60% over time of your money? You'd say, I wouldn't, you don't have to think about that one. Doing that one's never going to happen in a million years. Really? Let me give you a clue. If you own most mutual funds, that's the deal you've already got. They say, how is that humanly possible? Because people don't know what they're paying in fees, and they don't understand the power of compounding. Now, if you watched the last video that we just did together, you saw that little amounts of money can compound into huge amounts of money in a very short period of time. And the same thing happens with investing. Most of us start investing, and it, we don't invest tomorrow and get the return. We invest over decades. And investing over decades, these hidden fees build up and they eat away. The person I went to to get the answer for this was Jack Bogle. Jack Bogle is in his mid-80s, and Jack's been in the investment business now for 64 years. And here's what he said to me. He said, Tony, it's simple. Most people just don't do the math. The fees are hidden. He says, try this. If you made a one-time investment, just one time of $10,000 at the age of 20, someone gave you the money, you put it aside, 20 years old, and you just grew it at 7% per year over time, you'd have $574,464 by the time you got to my age, he said, which was 80. But if you just paid only 2.5% in management fees, and as you're going to learn in a few minutes, most management fees are more than 2.5%. I know they tell you it's 1%, but in this video, you're going to get an education so you don't get robbed in the future. But if you just pay 2.5% in management fees or other expenses, your ending account balance would have been only 140274 over the exact same time period. I said to him, Jack, how is that possible? I mean, how could, how, how could people be seduced like this? How could we be giving away that much? He goes, Tony, people don't do the math. The fees are hidden and the compounding happens over time. He said, it's insane. And that's why he built Vanguard. Because in Vanguard, there aren't all these hidden fees. If you were to invest in Vanguard and you say, I want to invest in the stock market instead of a mutual fund, you can own Vanguard's group of the market, this large number of companies, all the best companies, and you might be paying point 
one four percent. That's not even say t say 0.24 is called 24 basis points. That's a quarter of a percent. 0.25, 0.14. You get the idea. It's not even a percent. It's this tiny little number. So as you're investing, the compounding is all coming to you, not going to fees. Now, Vanguard's not the only company like this, but Vanguard is set up as a nonprofit organization. That's one reason why so many great investors make investments in Vanguard. Now, I don't have any investment in Vanguard personally. I don't make any money on Vanguard. It's nonprofit. I'm just telling you because it's one place to go. DFA funds is another. And as we go through the book, you're going to learn where are the best ways to protect yourself. But let's just start for a moment and say, let's you and I say we want to win this game. We want to master the game of money. To master the game, we got to tap the power of compounding. But number two, we've got to become insiders so that won't get taken advantage of. We've got to know the rules of the game before we get in or we're going to get hurt. Because in this place called finance, what you don't know will hurt you. So I want to make sure you know. Let's talk about for a second, though, about what is the path to financial freedom? What does it really look like? I like to think of it as a mountain. And if you want to visualize a mountain, maybe we'll throw something on the screen for you at this point. Just imagine that there's two primary steps in investing. The first step is early in your life, you spend most of your life accumulating money. You're working your tail off. If you're smart, you're taking a piece of that, keeping it for your family, putting your, your, your financial freedom fund. You're letting it grow. And as time goes by, you're climbing the mountain of financial success. Now, there's a point when you hit the peak. The peak is that when that money machine of yours has enough money in it that you've hit what we call the critical mass, a peak level where from now on, if you would invest that money in a relatively secure environment, the income from your investments would provide enough income for you to never have to work again. So step one is you climb the mountain. And climbing the mountain, there's a lot of things that knock you off the mountain, like bad fees, like bad advice, like bad investments. It can throw you down, back down the mountain, starting over. But if we can help you, and that's what I'm going to do here in this book, I'm going to guide you up the mountain. But once you get to the mountain, nobody talks about this. Most of the financial planners don't, and certainly brokers don't. You have to decide at some point, I'm going to take the money I have, and I'm going to start taking it out, and I'm going to start to spend it. I'm going to start to ski down the mountain at some point and just take in life, take in my family, enjoy what I'm doing in my life. And hopefully that'll last for you two or three decades. Because today, if people retire at 65, the average person lives to be 85 if they're 65 years old. That's 20 years of retirement. And that's the average. Many people live 30 years. So that's a long time to get skiing and enjoying. But to do that, you got to also, as part of this book, say, when do I start taking the money out and how do I make sure that money's going to really be there? Because if I climb the mountain and then the stock market drops 50%, then I, I'm no longer at the peak of the mountain. I'm almost starting over. I might be 65 years old, like what happened to people in 2008. Now, let me give you an idea of how we're going to help you get up that mountain. The first thing we're going to do is start looking at what those myths are that if you don't understand them, they can take you down very quickly, like, like missing the rocks and dropping quite a ways. And one of the first myths that people tell you all the time is, give us your money, we'll beat the market. Well, let me give you an idea of where do most people in America put their money? They put it in a 401k, right, or some form of retirement account. There aren't many pensions that are left unless you work for the government. Few very large organizations, but very few. And so your goal is to have a pension eventually. Your goal is to have an income for the rest of your life so you can ski down the mountain and have a great time with your friends and your family and do what you want to do. So how are we going to build up to that? Well, most people don't know where to put their money. Most people work their tail off at their job. They come home. They want to be a great lover and friend and parent, and they want to make a difference to their community and take care of their family. And I mean, we've got so many things, and we've got to be an investment expert on the side. And because we're not investment experts, the people that are the experts, they know how to rig and wire the system to chip away at what we have and compound it over time to get the majority of the profitability if we let them. In fact, David Swenson gave me a great quote. Uh, David Swenson is the gentleman who's the chief investment officer for Yale. And he took their endowment fund, which has taken a century, I guess, to accumulate of a billion dollars, and he converted it into 24 billion, to be exact, $23.9 billion today. And he did it in two decades. It's unheard of. He is the rock star of institutional investing. So if there's anybody I want to go to and say, where do investors put their money? Should they put it in mutual funds, which is where almost everybody does? In fact, he calls it the $13 trillion lie. And let me give you the exact quote of what he said to me. Quote, when you look at the results 
on an after fee, meaning after paying all the fees, and after tax basis over any reasonably long period of time, there's almost no chance that at the end you're going to beat an index fund with a mutual fund. Now, he wrote a book, by the way, called Unconventional Success, and this is a guy that is unmatched in the business. So most people are saying to you, and I talk about this in chapter 2.1, they're saying the first lie is we're going to beat the market. And most money managers are doing it through a mutual fund. But to give you an idea, here are the statistics. And this is a statistic you should know if you forget everything else on this video. This one will free you from hypnosis and from the marketing. Because by the way, ask Jack Bogle, how is it people are putting the money in mutual funds when they're putting the money up, they're, putting all the risk, they're taking all the risk, the other people aren't, and they're getting all this money taken out of their pocket? And he said, Tony, it's marketing. He said, you can market anything. We marketed people to smoke cigarettes for decades. You can get people to do the dumbest thing. First time you smoked a cigarette, what was it like? You can go, mm, yumbo, you cough like crazy, but then your brain went, hey, the sex will be worth it because you saw this advertising and it convinced you. He said, that's all we've done with mutual funds. That's all we've done with these financial institutions. So here's the statistic you need to know. 96% of all mutual funds, stay with me now, 96% of all mutual funds do not match the market, the general market, over any 10-year period of time. I want that you to sink in for a second. What does that mean? You have a choice. You can go to a mutual fund. Most mutual funds are going to tell you, if you ask the person, what are my fees? And they're going to say, well, the fees here is 1%. That 1% is usually what's called the expense ratio. But if you were to actually go through and stay with and go through the 30 or 40 or 50 page document and read all the legalese, you'll find out something very different. In fact, there's a gentleman who has a degree in economics. His name is Hilton Smith. And Mr. Hilton Smith decided that he wanted to understand why, why was the market going up, but his account wasn't going up. And having a degree in, a degree in economics, and he worked for Demos, which uh, is a, uh, uh, a fund of, of kind of brain, a brain trust, if you will. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a project to dig in here and figure out what I'm really spending. And a couple things happened. Number one, Forbes did an article and did some of the work for him. They went in and found out that the average mutual fund in America today charges 3.19%. And you say, that's not possible. Mine's only 1%. But what happens is you go underneath and the expense ratio is 1%, but in that contract of yours, there's all these other terms, A, B sources. There's all, there's literally, if you look at my book, there are 17 different terms for things that you may not know are fees, but they take money out of your pocket just the same. And when you take out 3.1%, imagine you're making a 6% return and your mutual fund costs you 3%. You mean you net 3% and you don't even net it because now you got to pay taxes on it. And oh, by the way, if you have a mutual fund, most of the mutual fund managers are saying to you what? Buy and hold, buy and hold on to us. But the mutual fund manager doesn't buy and hold. The mutual fund manager actually goes out and very often is trading all those stocks, all those bonds, trading constantly. So when things are being traded constantly, there's a tax impact. When you buy something and you hang on to it, a piece of real estate, anything, a share of stock, and you hold on to it for more than a year, a little past a year, you develop a different tax rate. You get what's simply called capital gains. Today, capital gains tax is 20%, and then you pay whatever your state tax is, as opposed to ordinary income, which might be 50% for you or close to it when you add everything in. So big difference in what you get to keep if you're in a mutual fund, they're trading constantly. You may keep the mutual fund for more than a year, but when you get your bill, you're going to get an ordinary income tax rate. So if you're a person who makes, you know, and you're a 50% tax rate, you had 6% return, 3% came out with fees, and now the balance of 3%, you're going to pay 50% in taxes. You're left with 1.50%. You make 1.5% for taking the risks of being in the stock market. It's crazy, totally crazy. But most people just don't know. They have no idea what really happens. So I want you to see two things here. First of all, I want to show you that trying to pick the right mutual fund is next to impossible because 96% of them don't match the market. Well, you could own the market for, let's call it 20 basis points. You know what that means now? It means 0.20. It means less than a quarter of a percent. Or you could have owned the same stocks through a mutual fund and paid 300% more or more, 3,000% more at 3% than 
than what would have actually cost to own the same product. If I said to you, you could own this car for $20,000 or someone else bought the car for three thirty thousand dollars <laughs> you know, $300 versus $30,000 or some ratio like that, you go, it's the same car. That's the same thing with these investments, but you're paying those kinds of fees. Am I making sense? I know I'm hammering this hard. So let's start, let's separate these two. First, are you ever gonna really beat the market? That's the myth everybody has. And I'm just here to tell you, it ain't gonna happen. Now, I'm not saying it. I've interviewed Warren Buffett. I've interviewed uh, Ray Dalio, one of the, the largest hedge fund in the world. I interviewed David Swenson. I've interviewed Jack Bogle. I've interviewed Nobel laureates. And they all, one after another after another, say nobody beats the market except a few unicorns. There's a tiny number of hedge fund guys like Ray Dalio who, like Paul Tudor Jones, who've been able to beat the market year after year for years. But unfortunately, I say nobody beats the market because you're not gonna have access to them. Ray Dalio stopped taking money a decade ago. It doesn't matter how rich you are. Paul Tudor will not take your money no matter what it has because these guys got so big that when they made an investment, it was so big, if they got in and out of the market, they couldn't get in and out. They weren't flexible. So the best people in the world are just not available anymore, and they're only available to the ultra witch anyway. So if you and I are gonna practically succeed, what's your chance of taking your 401k and picking the right mutual fund? Well, if 96% don't match the market, and only 4% do, I'm gonna find that 4%. Really, let me tell you what the chances of finding that 4% are. Ever played blackjack? If you go to Vegas or you know, wherever you go, Atlantic City, someplace in the world, play blackjack, go online and do it. I'm sure you know how to play. It's called 21. You try to get to 21 without going over. If you have 22, you lose. If anybody gets higher than you above that number under 21, they win. So how does it work? Well, let's say one day you're playing blackjack and you get delivered by the dealer you know, two face cards. They're worth 10 each, that's worth 20 points. If you go any higher, your chance of failing is really, really bad. If you're an inner idiot, there's only one card that can give you 21, that's an ace. There's only four in the whole deck. If your any idiot says, hit me, give me another card, you have an 8% chance of getting 21 in blackjack if you got two face cards and you get the one ace. You got an 8% chance of victory. Picking the right mutual fund, you got a 4% chance of victory. It's not gonna happen. In fact, if Warren Buffett, if you want to know how Warren Buffett feels about it, in his famous 2014 letter that he sent to all his shareholders, he explained that as the world has changed and what he wants done with his money is also the same, that when he passes, he wants his wife's money that's in trust, 90% of it to be put in index funds. And he said, why? Because you're just not going to beat the market. The markets are too efficient today. It's just not going to happen. So when Warren Buffett says this, you get a little clue what has to be done. But every other one of these experts that I talked about as well talked about it, that through time, somebody could win for a period of time. But over the years, the market itself is what really wins. In fact, Warren Buffett put his money where his mouth was. He built a million-dollar wager against New York-based protege partners. And what was the bet? He bet protege that if they couldn't pick, he'd give them up to five hedge fund managers, the best five in the world, and that the five hedge fund managers couldn't collectively beat what the S&P and 500 index did over a 10-year period. In other words, he's put his money in index where there's virtually no fees. They're going to have these huge fees on hedge funds. Let's see who wins. Well, guess what? As of February of 2014, the S&P 500 is up 43.8%, and those five hedge funds are only up 12.5%. They're light years behind, and they got a lot more expense. So, it's, it's kind of like, think about if you were like the world's fastest man, you know, Bolt's his name, you know, and now you're running against a pack of Boy Scouts. That's what happens when you own the index. That's how different it is. Now, Ray Dalio said, point blank, you're not going to beat the market. No one does. Only a few people are gold medalists, and most people don't have access to those people. So if you understand this, then you ought to understand that this is not just one research project. An industry expert named Robert Arnott, he's the founder of Research Affiliates, very well known, spent two decades studying the top 200 actively managed mutual funds. Now, what does actively managed mutual fund mean? And they're all over 100 million. When you go to a mutual fund, most of you are going to an active fund. You're saying, I'm gonna give my money to somebody. And what they're gonna do is, they're gonna take my money and they're gonna figure out where to put it because they're gonna be smarter than me. But in reality, 96% of the time, you could have just taken what the market was overall, a piece of the top companies, 96% of the time you'd be doing better. What did Arnott find out? The results were startling. 
From 1984 to 1998, a full 15 years, only eight out of 200 fund managers beat the Vanguard 500 index. That's again, less than 4% odds, exactly the same as the other study that I gave you. In fact, here's one that'll really mess up your head. There was a study done over a 20 year period starting December 31st, 1993, and it ended December 31st of 2013. And it was to find out what did the S&P 500 return on its average return versus what did the average mutual fund investor make? And it was done by a group called Dalbar, which is very famous. Here's what they found. Number one, if you own the index, if you just own the stock market, a piece of it all, you had an average compound rate of return of 9.28%. But the average mutual fund investor made just 2.54%. And that's Dalbar research. I mean, think about that. A nearly 80% difference between somebody who just owned the market versus somebody who got an index that cost them next to nothing. Now, some people say to him, Tony, no, no, I'm smarter than that. I go to Morningstar. I go look, and if you're not familiar with Morningstar, they're a rating service, and they rate all these funds. I go to Morningstar and I only go out in there and I get five-star funds. That's all I invest in. Well, five-star funds are so important that uh, a study that was done over a decade long found that 72% of people put their money in four and five-star funds. Two trillion dollars goes into whatever Morningstar calls a four or five-star fund. There's just one problem. Researchers went back all the way to 1999, did a 10-year study, and guess what they found out? Of those five-star funds, there were 248 mutual funds that were rated five stars. That was at the beginning of the period. At the end of the 10 years, only four of them were five stars. And David Swenson told me, he said, Tony, that star system is so important. I want to tell you how they manipulate it. He said, what mutual fund companies do is check this out. He said, wouldn't you love to invest like this? They open up five different types of funds. One's an international fund. One's a U.S. stock fund. They do all these different funds. And they see how they do. And the ones that don't do well, they eliminate. And the ones that do, they promote and market, and they say, we have this four-star, five-star fund that's getting you this great return. He said, wouldn't you love to tell your friends, make five different investments or 10, get rid of 90% of them when you lose money, only count the one that made you money and promote to your friends, you're the next Warren Buffett? He said, that's what they do. He said, Tony, I gotta tell you, that 96% you quoted, it's false. Because they don't count all the funds that they've either Immersed, immersed with another one so it disappeared or just let go of. I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling what's happened in this area. So as we roll along, I want you to understand that if you're going to really make money and compound your money, you're going to want to own the market. And you're going to want to not be paying ridiculous fees. And I will tell you one more thing. When people talk about fees, a lot of people think, well, because I'm in my 401k, then I don't have to worry about fees. In fact, a lot of people think there are no fees in their 401k. Some research showed that one third of people think there are no fees in their, in their 401k. Nothing can be further from the truth. Forbes article that showed the average mutual fund was 3.1%. They found the average fees that people are paying inside their 401k is worse than if they were been paying taxes, over 4%. Now, what's the impact of fees? Let me give you a little visual on this so you get a sense. Because otherwise, right now, you might be saying, Tony, you're babbling 1%, 3%, who cares? You should care. You understand compounding now, right? So let's do an example. Let's take three friends, and all three friends are equal. They're, they're 30 years old, and they all start out with, let's say, $100,000. or so the 35, and I start with $100,000. And they're going to invest for 30 years, from 35 years old to 65. They all invest in the exact same stocks. But one person does it in a mutual fund that charges 3%. One does it in a mutual fund that charges 2%, and one does it in a mutual fund that charges 1%. Well, let me figure out here, just for a second, what's the impact of that? Well, the person who was only charged 1% in fees, their $100,000 over 30 years, growing at 7% compounded, 100,000 becomes $574,349. It becomes almost six times what they started with, and all it did was let that money grow. I didn't add money. It was just compounding. That's the power of compounding once again. Tap the power, baby. But if we roll a little further, you start to look down, and what do you find out? You find out the person that was being charged 1%, excuse me, 3% in fees, they found themselves in a very, very different world. Those people, that person, instead of having almost $600,000, has 
literally $324,000, $340 left. They literally have 77% less money. And what was different? They invested in the same stocks. They invested in the same pieces. The only difference were the fees. 77% went to fees. So one person's got almost a million dollars, and the other person is probably trying to figure out how they're going to survive, because that won't last very long. In fact, Jack Bogle, the founder of Vanguard, says, quote, I think high costs eroding away your returns are as much a risk for investors as the economic situation in Europe or China. So you don't want to get pulled into this. And I do recommend you read the article in the book. It's the Forbes article. It's called The Real Cost of Owning Mutual Funds. It's written by Ty Burnick, and he peels back the layers to dissect the actual costs and arrive at that heart-stopping total of the average mutual fund costing a 3.17%. And on 401k plans, which you're supposed to have as a low cost, he started finding out the hefty expenses were even more. It's the average plan administrator. To, to do your 401k, they charge an administration fee. It's somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5% annually, according to the nonpartisan government accountability group. That's what they found. So that's $1,300 of every 100,000 just to participate in the 401k. So when you have that 1.3% on top of the 3.17%, you can actually be paying more expensive to own a supposedly tax-free account or tax-deferred account. You might be paying 4.47 to 4.67%. Now, it's a bunch of numbers. What the hell does that mean? Once again, if you're getting a 6% return and someone's taking away 4.47%, that means you're getting 1.5%. And then you have to pay taxes on the 1.5%. That's totally insane. Are you becoming an insider? See, I want you to get it. Next time someone says, I'm going to beat the market. They might. They might be beat the market for a year or two or three or four, but they're not going to do it over a decade or more. Nobody does. Nobody stays that way. There's a few unicorns. I'm going to introduce them to you in this book. I'm going to show you how they invest. You can do it directly if you want to, but it's not going to happen through a mutual fund. Again, I'm not here telling you anything that's my opinion. Everything in this book, as you go through the book, you'll see there's nothing that's my opinion except what to do emotionally. When it comes to investing, this is not the Tony Robbins show. This is the show of the Ray Dalios. This is the show of the Jack Bogles. This is the show of David Swenson. This is the show of Kyle Bass, who took 30 million and made it 2 billion in two years. This is the show of Paul Tudor Jones, who's made money every year for 28 consecutive years. This is the show of the best on earth. They're the first time they're opening the doors and they're showing you what's happening. So let me give you one more myth and then we'll get out of this section. Are you seeing, by the way, what a difference this can make? I mean, I give you a $100,000 example. Many of you out there, you're going to accumulate a million dollars. A million dollars growing at 7% with 3% fees versus a million dollars growing at 7% with 1% fees. It's the difference between $7 million versus $4 million. It's just a $3 million difference. The numbers only get more intense if you don't take care of yourself. So in the book, I'm showing you how to do that. But what's the most valuable way to take care of yourself? Because right now, my guess is I'm talking 100 miles an hour. I'm passionate. That's why it's better to read the book. But some people want to watch the video, so I'm here for you. <laughs> but you're saying, like, Tony, you're running these numbers for me. Let me do what do I take from this? Here's what you take. You're going to be taken unless you become an insider. What's the first rule? Nobody beats the market. How are you going to protect yourself? If you make investments of this sort, you're going to be looking more likely to own the market in an index. And the second piece they're going to tell you is fees don't matter. You're going to go, BS, fees are compounded and they matter. In fact, Mr. Hilton Smith, when he did his research, he found that somebody who only makes 30000 a year on average in their lifetime will lose $150,000 in fees. That's a small investment. That's someone who's, that's to give you an idea, if you're making 30000 a year, that's five years of retirement that they give up in fees. Now, most people watching a video like this, most people reading my books, earning substantially more than 30000 a year. So if you're in the $100,000 range, it might be a half a million dollars or more in fees. Just think about that. This book, this little video, if you hear me right now, if you'll stay with me and just go, I am not going to be taking advantage. I'm an insider. No one's going to beat the market long term, so I'm going to go for indexes on those areas. I'm not going to let somebody hammer me on fees. I'm going to go for the lowest possible fees, and I'm not going to get deluded by somebody pumping me up with some story. I'll tell you a third why you should be aware of. Average returns. Average returns. You know, you might have your broker say to you something like, hey, you know, 
You know, overall, you're doing good. Your average return is X. Let me give you an example. Let's say you buy a bunch of investments and your broker says to you, well, you know, overall, it's not bad. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say, imagine a stock market, and this is an imaginary, goes up, or a stock, you own Apple, and it goes up 50%, and then it drops 50%. And then it goes up 50%, and then it drops 50%. Just watch that. Up 50, down 50, up 50, down 50. Look, it looks like a straight line, doesn't it? On paper, it's a straight line. On paper, your average rate of return was zero. You didn't make money, but you didn't lose money. But if you put dollars to this, you'll see it's quite different. Because there's, there's what we call average returns, and then there's actual returns. And I'll give you a clue. Actual returns are the only thing you can spend money on. You can't take average returns. So let's say you put $100,000 in, and it goes up 50% to 150000 Now that 150 is going to drop 50% down to 75000 Now it goes up 50%. Oh, wow, 75000 going up 50%. Hmm, now I'm on 100 and what, 5,000. I'm off on my number, they'll put it on the screen. And then it drops 50% and look where you end up. You end up not even, you end up down 43.75%. Check it out. And you would have thought you were even. See, these are the types of tricks people use to manipulate your mind and get your money. So let me finish with one final lie that might be really helpful for you. Let's see what we've learned so far in this film. One. We've learned nobody beats the market. We've learned that we have to really be smart in this area because it's easy to be seduced. Somebody might beat it for a while, but not long term, not according to Warren Buffett, not according to the 50 best experts that I've interviewed. Second, fees do matter. So we want to reduce those fees as low as humanly possible. Third, average returns are not real returns. In fact, in mutual funds, the numbers they actually advertise, when you say that's the rate of return they've gotten, is not the return you're going to see. Because the vast majority of people, and by the way, Jack Bogle goes crazy about this in my interviews, the average person thinks, oh, if I put my money in that mutual fund, that's the return I would have gotten. But most people put their money in at different stages, like a certain amount each month to your 401k. Your actual rate of return is not the same as the whole year. They might have had a good month. If you weren't in that good month, or you only had a certain amount of money in that good month, you didn't make an 8% or 9% return. You made something far less. So there's a lot manipulating you. So where do you go? Where do you go to trust somebody? Well, here's the worst part. First, somebody tells you they're going to help you beat the market. They don't. Then they're going to tell you fees don't matter, and they're going to have you take the risk, you put up the money, and they're going to take a lot of money. Then thirdly, they might promote to you, you're doing okay on average. And then after all that, here's the fourth lie. They'll look in the eye and say, I have your best interests in mind. <laughs> and unfortunately, then maybe the person representing you does. Meaning, the world we live in today is a bizarre world. The financial industry has, hum has just huge influence because of the economics that they spend on Congress, and lobbying Congress. And the person who's representing you, in most cases, who's representing your money and your investments, is not legally required to make sure they put your interests ahead of their own. In fact, there's a legal distinction for it. And that legal distinction is this idea of whether or not you have to have what's called a suitable investment versus a fiduciary. Now, I know your brain's going to want to be fried for a moment, but if you stay with me on this, I can promise you I can save you a ton of money and get you the advice and find somebody you can trust. There are 302 names for a broker today. They're everything from wealth advisor to broker. They're every term you can imagine. What makes somebody a broker is they represent a big company, let's say a big bank, for example. And so they're really a salesperson. They can only sell you what you have. If you go to a Toyota dealership, they're not going to sell you a BMW. They can only sell you what they have. And they make the company, what they promote is what the company is designed to make money off of. So whatever fund they're going to sell you, they're designed to make money off it, and that's what they're selling. Now, this person selling to you might be sincere. They might care deeply about you. They may truly, they may even put their money the same place you put yours. But they could be sincere and be sincerely wrong because they're part of a captured system. Let, let me give you an example. I watched a video. A friend of mine sent this to me. It was a YouTube video. And it's called The Butcher versus the Dietitian. And it's a simple video, but it's so smart. It's one of those cartoon videos where the guy speaks and they draw it. And what they did in this video is the man on the, in the video says, listen, let me explain to you the difference between what we would call a broker 
and what you would call uh, a registered investment advisor, an RIA, a registered, or also the word is used as a fiduciary, somebody who is legally required to put your needs ahead of their own. He said, if you go to most parts of the country and you go to a, a butcher shop and you go and you go, I'm having dinner with some friends over, what do you suggest? One thing's for sure, whatever they're gonna suggest is gonna be meat <laughs> because that's all they sell. So they might say, we got some great lamb chops here, or we got this roast that's come from here, or we got this steak that comes down from South America. It's the best stuff, it's the best stuff we got. That's what they're gonna sell you. If you go to a butcher, they're gonna sell you meat. But if you went to a dietitian and you said, uh, what's, what should I have for dinner tonight? I'd like to have some meat. They might say, hey buddy, I know you want some meat, but let me just show you something. You got, you're gonna cholesterol's getting up, you're gonna have a heart attack. Maybe it's time for a little fish for you. Maybe it's time for a little rice. Maybe there's a little more salad for you. So a dietitian will actually tell you what's best for you because they're not getting paid to sell meat. They're getting paid for their advice versus a broker is a butcher. Their job is sincerely to sell you the best meat they think they have. But you gotta remember, there's an organization deciding what meat to sell you and how they can make the most profit from it. So when I watched this video, I was really intrigued. I thought it was such a simple way of describing it. It said what a fiduciary is, a registered investment advisory, an RIA, a fiduciary, is someone you go to who is required by law to make sure what they get you is best for you. The broker has a different rule, and the rule is called suitability standard. I know this sounds like legalese, but you gotta understand this, because if you don't, you'll get taken advantage of. Here's what that means. Suitable just means they asked you some questions, they heard your goals, and that they think that what they're offering you could help you get your goals. There's no way you're gonna sue somebody over the suitability standard and say they didn't take care of me, it's not gonna happen. So interestingly enough, I'll give you a perfect example. Like, suitability is the lowest standard you can imagine. If somebody has a suitability standard, they tell you to buy Apple this morning or Microsoft or whatever, IBM, and they sell you that stock, and then later in the day, they buy it cheaper, no problem, they won. But if someone's a fiduciary, if they're a registered investment advisory, and they represent your best interest, they legally, if they told you to buy Apple or Microsoft, and you bought it this morning, and they buy it cheaper tonight, they have to give you their stock. It's required by law. They have to put your interests ahead of their own. You would think that everyone would be legally responsible to put their interest behind yours, make you first. But in the financial industry, it's not that way. And there have been huge pushes by Congress to try to bring the fiduciary standard to all financial people. And the financial system has fought it off with big dollars and big lobbyists. So you have to understand this. So one of the things that I really try to do is say, okay, in my book, I'm showing you what to do, but I wanted to be able to say, okay, if you feel like you want someone to do this for you, where do you go? You do not want to go to a broker, even if they're a good guy. As Ray Dalio said, you think that broker's your doctor and he isn't your doctor. He might be sincere, he might care, he might even done okay for a while, but he's not a gold medalist and he's not gonna know where to put your money and he's gonna be selling you what he's supposed to sell you. It's part of a boilerplate, boilerplate part of a room. So when I watched that little video on the dietitian you know, versus the, the, the beef salesman, so to speak, the butcher, I found out that the founder of that particular company, uh, the man who did it behind it, was the head of a company called Hightower. And Hightower is right now the 13th fastest growing company in the United States in Inc. Magazine. And it's also the fifth largest registered investment advisory in the world. And they have uh, 30 billion, with a B, dollars worth of assets. And I noticed, I went to meet this man, I interviewed him, and he started telling me stories about what happens in the system that just made me crazy. He said, Tony, here's the common thing people will do. They'll say, I'll do all your investments for the stock market, for equities, for 1%, and I'll do all your bonds for free. He said, Tony, it's not free. They just don't charge you a commission. And he started walking me through this stuff called bond math, where you might be paying 6% or six points on something you thought you are paying nothing for. So I, I started a pitch and catch with this man, and Elliot is just a brilliant, brilliant guy. And so after we spent hours and hours together, I said to him, Elliot, I said, your job, what you've done as I understand at Hightower, is you're taking care of ultra-wealthy people. And you're coming in, and you're showing them what all the fees really are, and you're eliminating all the fees. You're not taking the profit. You're just delivering services for a fee, for a percentage. He said, that's right. I said, why aren't you doing that for the average person? 
He goes, Tony, I'd love to. He said, you know, the, the system is, is messed up and, you know, there's no transparency. He said, it's just, you know, you just can't do it profitably with people because it takes so much time to service somebody. And if you're taking a tiny percentage, like 1% or less of their, of their assets as a fee, you know, 95 basis points, less than 1% or less. He said, you need somebody who has a lot of money for the time you do it. I said, I understand that. But I said, the average person is getting screwed. They have no idea what they're paying for in fees. They have no idea how much risk they're really taking. They don't even know what their real return is. Someone's telling me an average return. He said, I know. I said, you should do this. I said, even if you don't make money, you should do this and you should use technology. Because you could get, today, instead of using a human being's brain taking hours to do that, you could do this with technology. And I basically pitched him on saying, I want you to go and think about this and think about how to bring the level of advice you give to ultra wealthy people to the average person. What was really cool is he felt the spirit of it and we built a real great relationship. And over the next three months, he went back and worked with his teams. And he finally came back and he said, Tony, I introduced him to some people that had some patented technology that was extraordinary. I have no investment in it. I wasn't selling it. I just said, these guys are the best. I connected with him. He said, I need somebody just to be my partner. I need a, a chief investment officer that's somebody that's really brilliant so that we don't just have technology, but we have people on the ground that can help people as well. And he said, I'd like to find a way to partner with him. So I introduced him to a man named AJ Gupta from Stronghold Financial Services. And Stronghold Financial is a great organization. In fact, I know they're great because uh, he's, had, he's been my registered investment advisor for my family for almost seven years. And he's done amazing things for my family. So I introduced the two of them together. And they got together, took their decades worth of experience. And by the way, uh, AJ Gupta was picked by um, uh, Charles Schwab this last year. And they made him the cover, the example, if you would, the, of the best of the best of the 10,000 registered investment advisors. So he's kind of the face of registered investment advisors in the ad you'll see for Charles Schwab, because Charles Schwab was so impressed by AJ. So I got AJ together, along with Elliot, pushed them really hard, and they put together what's called Stronghold Financial. And if you go to strongholdfinancial.com, they built a site where within seconds, you can put in your accounts, and it'll pull all of them together, and it'll tell you three things for you. It'll, number one, tell you immediately what are your real costs of what you're doing. Like, what are the real expenses and it'll show those costs so you know what they cost versus what you could have got it for. And it shows it right there so you know what your expenses are. And the second thing it does is it shows you what your level of risk is. Because a lot of people are taking a level of risk they don't even, they're not even aware of. And then thirdly, it shows you what your return has been over the last 10 or 15 years for whatever you've invested in, your real return. And then lastly, it shows you, it compares if you would have invested in something else, like a different example, a portfolio, including one designed by Ray Dalio, the man who has... The man who created the fund I told you about in the first video that's been 85% successful, made money 85% of the time, tracking back, backtracking it to literally 75 years. And the man that's, you know, he's made in his own funds, in his alpha fund, he's made 21% per year for 23 straight years. So he designed a fund you'll learn about in the book later on, or a portfolio, I should say. So it shows you how you're doing compared if you did that, what the risk level is, what the return is. So it's kind of like uh, looking under the hood of your broker. And so I'm really excited. Now, why would they do and By the way, when you're all done, you get to see all this, and it's free. And you can now go take that information, and you can go invest it on your own, do it yourself. Or you say, look, I'd like these guys to become my registered investment advisor, and you can click one button, and you can make them a client, and they charge you less than 1% to manage all that you do, and they bring you other types of, of elements as well. And when I say it's less than 1%, the more money you have, the lower it gets, just like any other registered investment advisor. So... Uh, I'm really proud of helping to kind of put this together. These guys are bringing conflict-free advice to you and you're on your own to be able to go apply it or you can work with them. I have no vested interest in this. I could have. Uh, they offered me a third of the company for bringing this together. And instead I said, you take what you would have given me, that third, and I want you to put it into financial literacy and to feeding people, my passion. So that's what they're doing. I am going to work with them on the ultra wealthy side at some point here with helping people of that nature because if I help those people, they have the money and they can afford it and I, I can participate in that process. So I'm real proud of what it is and you can go to literally to strongholdfinancial.com and you can begin to test this out for yourself if you'd like. So just think about this though, more than a third of workers in this country, a third of baby boomers have less than $1,000 saved for retirement. And when you look at things like that, when you look at the fact that 77% of Americans say they have financial stress, but they don't have a plan. 
what these guys have done at Stronghold is they're basically showing you how to create a plan in minutes. And that plan that you might have spent $1,000 or $1,500 for, now you can take and just do it on your own. So why are they doing this, by the way? Not to already figure out it's the right thing to do, but they're also not stupid. What do we talk about? The secret to wealth is do more for others than anybody else. And the wealthy people that they normally manage, they didn't start out wealthy. So they're hoping that if they take care of you now, you get stuff for free, but as time goes by, you'll probably remember them and become a client and then hopefully a lifelong client and a raving fan, and that's how they're gonna build their business. Um, by the way, you might say, well, Tony, is Stronghold the only place I can go? Of course not. What you wanna do is go get yourself a registered investment advisor. Now you can, by the way, you can do all this yourself. You don't have to have an RIA. But if you want some advice, you want somebody who's required by law to be on your side. And the only thing I'm gonna tell you is this. Uh, I've included in the book the website for uh, registered investment advisors all over the country. So I want you to be clear. You don't have to go to the guys at Stronghold to do that. But in the book, I give you five things to evaluate to know whether or not they're qualified or not. And I would tell you that not all financial planners are equal. In fact, I'll tell you a statistic that's crazy. Um, and I have this in the book, and you can see the actual study, it's crazy. 46% of financial planners have no retirement plan. That's right, 2,400 financial planners were actually surveyed anonymously in a 2013 study by the Financial Planning Association, and close to half say they don't practice what they preach. Now that's crazy, now to be fair to them, the world is so complex right now, many people don't know what to do. So if you're gonna get a fiduciary, Think of them two ways. I think of it as two measurements you want, like a cross. First thing I want to know is, are they really a fiduciary? On this side, like, you know, to the left is people that are just salesmen. The middle line here is where legally they're required to take care of me, and some people are trained to be a better fiduciary than others. Like your lawyer, your accountant, they're a strong fiduciary. They're only going to do what's in your interest required by law. And a very strong fiduciary will do the same. But you can be a strong fiduciary, and we gotta measure something else. Are you really sophisticated? Do you have some of the best choices? Do you know investments where I can make uh, a return, for example, where I'm guaranteed not to lose money in the stock market and still get 80% or 90% of the upside? Very few do. Do you know, for example, how I can invest in senior housing where I might get a 7% return and 50% of the upside? You know, to know what other types of investments are available, I need somebody more sophisticated versus less sophisticated. You can have a fiduciary who's really looking out for your interest, but they're not very sophisticated. They're a good person, but they don't know much. Or you can get a fiduciary that knows a lot. The wealthy have high, high, high sophisticated people. Some get taken advantage of, but the smartest ones have fiduciaries as well. So that's like Hightower. Our goal is move you from left up to right, if you will, to where you have high sophistication and high fiduciary. And that's one of the things we try to do here with Stronghold, to bring some of those resources down for you. But again, you pick who you want. All I'm gonna tell you here in the end is, make sure that whoever's gonna represent you is on your side legally, not just in sincere, not just they care, you want a fiduciary, okay? So we covered a whole lot in this session, my gosh. <laughs> we covered four of the lies, quick review. Number one, you know the first of the seven steps now. You know that the bottom line to getting to getting to financial freedom is you gotta tap the power of compounding. You gotta become an investor and owner in American stock market or in stocks and bonds. You gotta become an investor, period. Real estate, whatever. You can't just be a consumer. And the way you do that is you pick a percentage, you automate it, and you start building a freedom fund. Have you done that first step? If you haven't, when you close this, go to Fidelity, go to Schwab, find a way to automate and take a percentage off that's gonna be automated every month where you don't see the money. Two, this session, become an insider. You got to become an insider. You got to know the rules of the game before you get in. Rule number one, nobody beats the market long term. Get yourself an index if you're gonna be in those markets. And there's all kinds of indexes you'll learn. There's real estate indexes, not just stock markets. What you wanna do, number two, is fees do matter. You don't wanna be paying a ton of fees. You wanna be in that 1% range or below, not two and 3%, or maybe even less than 1% if you're just doing it all yourself and you have a small amount. Take a look at your 401ks. In the book, I have a whole chapter on 401ks that's really simple. And if you're an owner, you better read it because most owners don't realize they're the fiduciary. You're responsible legally to your people to make sure your plan is the best. And if it's not, you can be fined $600,000. Take a look at the book, it'll get your full attention. You're required by law each year to compare your 401k to the best of the best. And if you don't do that, you're exposed by the Department of Labor. Anyway, important piece, 401ks. Third, 
Don't get sucked into average returns. Up, down, up, down, looks even. You're down 43.75% on that same example. Going up 50, down 50, up 50, down 50. So you're not going to get seduced. Fourth, even if you like your broker, even if they got a beautiful name like wealth manager, make sure who's representing you as a fiduciary. You don't want a suitable investment. How do you feel if somebody said, let's go have a, let's go have a meal there. The food's suitable. Or what if you said, honey, how was the sex tonight? Well, it was suitable. <laughs> you don't want that. You want the best. You want somebody on your side. You want fiduciary, baby. You don't want a butcher. You want a dietitian. Am I making sense? I hope this session's been helpful to you. I uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. This uh, video has been designed to be part of this initial series, but I'm going to expand this series as time goes by. And if you're interested, you can find out more in the future. But right now, all the answers you need are in your book, Money, Master the Game. Those seven simple steps to financial freedom. Take them now, begin them now. Take these first two steps and you'll be on the fast track to the wealth you deserve. Thanks for letting me participate. I hope you come online and communicate what you think of our programs and I hope I someday get to meet you in person real soon. Live strong and live with passion.